Hey, what's going on everyone? Greg here and I can't wait to talk about this MacBook Air. So the MacBook Air was released a little over a week ago and I've been using it right alongside the MacBook Pro. So trust me when I say that this might be not only the best MacBook Air, but possibly the best laptop that I have ever used. Listen, the worst thing about this product is probably the design because it hasn't been changed at all. That means it still comes in a wedge-shaped design that is thicker towards the end and thinner towards the bottom. It still weighs in at 2.8 pounds and it comes in silver, space gray, or gold. The Air starts at $999 for 256 gigabytes of storage and eight gigabytes of unified memory. This is the version that I'm using, and this version also has a seven core GPU as opposed to the 512 gigabyte version's eight core GPU. On the side, you still just have two Thunderbolt ports. This time Apple says they are the USB 4 Thunderbolt spec. Honestly, this is pretty much the same as Thunderbolt 3, except I think that now they don't have to use a license. I think one of the bigger regressions with this port is that actually right now you can only connect one external display using this standard port configuration, which probably isn't going to be an issue for most MacBook Air owners, but for those of you who like to use multiple monitors, you can't do it on this one. Another big issue is obviously the lack of other ports, like a USB-A port, an HDMI port, or an SD card reader, but that's nothing new to the MacBook Air. I would recommend buying something like this Anchor USB-C hub, and it should solve most of your port issues. Open up the MacBook Air, and you're greeted with the same great Magic Keyboard as the last 2020 iteration. There are actually a few functional changes here, as Apple has removed the Launchpad feature from the F4 key and replaced it with spotlight search. I'm a little conflicted on this. Maybe I was one of the only people that was using the launchpad feature with the function key row, but I do miss having it there. And now I have to have that mapped in my dock. The F5 and F6 key are also changed. Those used to have functions to change keyboard brightness, but now they are used for more useful dictation and do not disturb features. I like this change a lot as I never really messed with my keyboard brightness before and Apple does a pretty good job of automatically changing the brightness levels anyway. Another small keyboard change is the FN key in the bottom left corner. This now brings up a quick selection for emojis, which is Pretty handy. Other than that, the keyboard is pretty much the same as last year's, and it still has a Touch ID fingerprint sensor in the top right corner for logging into your Mac, getting past password protected apps, or auto-filling passwords in Safari. The bigger, more understated change this year is in the MacBook Air's display. Apple now uses the same P3 wide color gamut display as the MacBook Pro. The last version of the Air shipped with a standard sRGB display. The P3 display allows for 25% more colors than a standard sRGB display, and this not only makes the display look a little better, but it also helps photographers or video editors color grade more precisely. Not that I would know anything about that. And most people won't care about that either. All you really need to know is that the display looks great. It still has the same 2560 by 1600 resolution for sharp text and that the brightness gets up to 400 nits, which is 100 nits less bright than the MacBook Pro, but it's usually more than enough for me as I've noticed that I tend to have my MacBook Air set to four brightness squares away from the max brightness setting. I think the main takeaway here is that in most use cases, you can put the Air's display right next to the MacBook Pros and see no difference in quality, and that is a big win for potential MacBook Air customers. Speakers are also good for a thin and light laptop, but they're the same as last year's model with no noticeable improvements to my ears. And the microphone quality is also the same and doesn't get the updated studio quality microphones that the more expensive 13 inch MacBook Pro receives. What is updated, however, is the MacBook Air's webcam. Now, while there's no hardware changes to the webcam, it's still only a 720 p video resolution webcam, which seems downright sad when our phones are capable of shooting 4K 60 frames per second on the front facing camera, but the MacBook Air's lid is also much thinner than our smartphones, so 
would you really take a thicker lid for a better webcam? I don't know if most people are making that trade off, but in today's world of social distancing and web conferencing, Video calling has become more important than ever, and while by all means the webcam on here is still far behind what your cell phone or your iPad can do, it is still an improvement over the 2020 Intel MacBook Air. That's thanks to Apple including its own image signal processor on the M1 chip, which leads to better skin tones, noise reduction, and better white balancing. I think for most people, in adequate lighting conditions, the webcam will be fine for video chatting, web conferencing, virtual schooling, and so on. However, in low light, all of the improvements that Apple has made with the M1 chip quickly disappear. Okay, this is a test of the MacBook Air microphones and also the MacBook Air webcam. So we can see, is there really a difference between the microphone system on the MacBook Air and maybe some hidden webcam differences? I don't think so, but who knows? At this point in the review, you're probably about to click off the video and go watch something else. Because most of what I have said sounds so similar to the past three generations of MacBook Airs. But don't click off just yet, because here is where we get to talk about the main reason you're going to want to buy the MacBook Air, and that is the fantastic, the amazing, the magical, M1 chip. Because while we did cover a few changes with this year's model, for the most part, it would be such a minor update if it was still shipping with the same Intel processor. But this time, Apple is making its own processor for the MacBook Air, and the M1 chip delivers on multiple fronts of power, speed, and efficiency. Remember in my past few MacBook Air reviews where I had to put a disclaimer saying something like, the MacBook Air is great if you want to use it for basic tasks, but if you need to do something more power intensive, you should probably buy the MacBook Pro. Well, that's not really the case anymore. In terms of power, the MacBook Air is a generational leap from last year's model. It's not even close. Sure, it can handle all the basic tasks most people buying the Air are probably going to do, and it does those everyday activities faster than ever. The M1 chip can load an app in just a second, so apps like web browsing, video calling, word processing, email, spreadsheets, keynote presentations, note taking. But let's get back to the power of the air, because not only did it handle those basic tasks with ease, it can pretty much handle any task. And I mean any task that I threw at this machine, like video editing, photo editing, or when I'm editing my podcast. The things that I do every day to run this channel, the MacBook Air handled it like a piece of cake, a piece of crumb cake. Better yet, it handled them like a piece of pie, a piece of pecan pie. For example, I can edit my 10 minute, 10 bit 4K video files in Final Cut Pro 10, and the timeline was super smooth for the entire edit. I did run into some issues in projects that were longer than 10 minutes, but that was due to the limitation of the eight gigabytes of memory on my model and not the M1 processor. Exporting video on the M1 Air was also fast, twice as fast as the previous Intel version of the MacBook Air, and a few seconds faster than my 2019 eight core Vega 48, 40 gigabytes of RAM, Intel iMac. Yes, the Air beat my iMac in Final Cut Pro export times at one fourth the cost. And it's doing this all without a spinning fan inside of the laptop. That means that the MacBook Air runs completely silent. That's right, no more opening up an app and having that loud fan spin while you're trying to focus or when you're sitting in class pretending to be taking notes and you're secretly playing a video game. Yeah, I'm talking to you, John. How could you? Well, now your computer won't sound like a jet engine trying to take off whenever you load up a game, edit a video, or do any intensive task like opening Chrome and watching YouTube. Now, you might be inclined to think that the MacBook Air would get extremely hot trying to do all these tasks and export video or playing a game or writing Cinebench benchmarks all day just for fun. You all do that, right? Not just me. Uh, anyway, you'd be wrong because the MacBook Air barely even gets warm during those intensive workloads. The M1 chip just requires so much less power than what previous generation Intel processors required that it leads to systems that run way cooler. 
This efficiency also leads to much better battery life with Apple rating the MacBook Air at 18 hours of max usage if you're just watching video. Now, if there's one shortcoming of this review, it's that I haven't done an official battery test, but that's because the battery is so good and can go for multiple days without me having to charge it. So it seems kind of pointless to run the MacBook Air through a synthetic battery benchmark especially because the battery life will differ depending on what kind of apps you run or how many apps you run through Rosetta 2, which will use a little bit more battery life, but even then, the Air is still a battery champ. Speaking of Rosetta 2, this is a translation layer that basically translates older apps not running natively on the M1 chip. And in almost every instance of these legacy apps, they mostly ran just fine and really had zero issues. And honestly, I couldn't tell you what app was running natively on these M1 Macs and which ones were going through the translation layer. So for the average user, this means nothing. And in a good way, it means that even if you're using apps through Rosetta 2, they should perform and work pretty well. And honestly, at times I couldn't tell which apps were optimized for the M1 chips and which ones were running through Rosetta because from the user's perspective, they click on an app and it just runs. And it runs just as fast, if not faster, than what the previous Intel MacBook Air was capable of already. And seriously, almost every aspect of the performance, the power efficiency, and the downright amazing thermals make this laptop feel like something from the, the, the future. Hello everyone, future Greg here. The last time we met, I told you all about the wimpy 12 inch MacBook. I said that this was a computer that could have been from the future, but it failed. It wasn't powerful enough. Despite its sleek design, it's no fan. It still got raging hot. It was hotter than lava. It was crazy. But now I'm here to tell you, well, you probably already know, that I found something better from the future. The 13 inch MacBook Air, complete with the futuristic M1 processor. Future from the future. So, 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 so. That's right, I came back in time to give Apple the M1 technology to make this MacBook Air so you could benefit from cooler computers that could run at better power. These are so strong! These have the power to edit 4K videos, photo editing, development, music production, whatever you want to throw at this MacBook Air, it can pretty much handle it. Except for gaming, but only little wimpy men play games! Not like me, future Greg. I came back in time to save you by giving you such a sleek and wonderful MacBook Air. And it is like air. It's so light, so thin. I can hold it with one hand. Even you little wimpy people out there can hold this with one hand. That's how light it is. And it's made from metallic aluminum. And I'm here to tell you that things aren't like they used to be in the past. Now, if you're deciding between a MacBook Air and a MacBook Pro, you no longer have to make a decision to go with the MacBook Pro if you're doing any intensive workloads. Now you can stick with the MacBook Air if you need to save a little bit of money, if you like the function key row, if you like the design, if you want to add more storage or more RAM or more memory. Now you can do that all with the MacBook Air without driving up to that higher cost of the MacBook Pro. The MacBook Air really is like a computer from the future. Prove of it. Of course I approve of it. It is a computer from the future, just like me, future Greg. Now, let me go back to the past and hand it off to that inferior model, past Greg. Uh, what he said. So yes, the MacBook Air is quite frankly the best overall laptop that I have ever used. And at this price point, it delivers tremendous value in terms of performance, portability, and battery life. So yes, if you need a new laptop, buy the MacBook Air. It's really that good. All right, everyone, I really hope this video helped you out in deciding if the MacBook Air was right for you. If it did, please leave me a like. And if you're going to purchase a MacBook Air, consider using my affiliate link in the description below. If you wanna see more from my channel, hit the subscribe button. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone. And don't forget, I'll be 
Black.